Last one, everyone. So uh, all that we have left to cover as far as our standards are Newton's laws of motion. There are three of them. It is super important that you know these three laws. All right. So like write them down, rewrite them down, rewrite them down. You'll see them here. You'll see them in life. And more importantly, you'll see them in ninth grade. And so uh, you're going to want to know these things. So the essential question here is, what are the laws that govern the motion of the universe? All motion that occurs falls under these three laws. So uh, vocabulary that you need to be familiar with. Force. Remember, force is a push or pull on an object that causes the object to move some distance um, or change shape. All right. So we're either changing the speed, we're changing the motion, or we're changing the shape of that object. And then acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So how quickly is the velocity changing? How quickly are we going from 0 to 60? All right, or so forth. So who was Sir Isaac Newton? Strapping young lad, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton lived from 1642 to 1726. He was one of the most influential scientists of all time since ideas about motion and gravity became the basis for modern physics. So a lot of what we see is all because of Sir Isaac Newton. And again, that's how we get the unit for force because his last name. So we just get the N for Newton's. Newton's three laws of motion are still being widely used to this day to describe the ways that objects move in everyday life and the ways that the planets and moons move around the universe. So that gravitational force that we talked about last video, he also founded that as well. So the first law, numero uno, all right, says an object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So basically, everything wants to stay the way that it is, right? That's why when you're running, you're like an object in motion stays in motion. Just kidding. Just tired. Right? No. Um, but an object in motion stays in motion. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. This chair is not just going to be like, you know what? I think I want to move. No. There has to be a force applied to put that chair into motion. All right? And for an object that's already in motion, a force has to be applied to get it to stop. So if there's a car that's moving, that car has the force of friction applied when they push the brakes in order to get it to stop and that sort of thing. Objects in the universe are lazy. If they're just sitting there, they want to just keep sitting there. That's right, chair. You're lazy. All right? If they're moving, they want to keep that same motion as well. This phenomenon is known as inertia. All right? Inertia is a very um, important term to know. It's just that objects in motion stay in motion, objects at rest stay at rest. That's what they want to do. All right? The greater the mass, the greater the inertia. The greater the speed, the greater the inertia. So as mass increases, inertia increases. As um, speed increases, inertia increases. Example, when you're riding in a car, and it suddenly stops. Your body's going to continue to move forward, right? You get this weird thing where you're like, right? That's because your body is still going in the direction that the force was being applied. All of a sudden, there was a force causing it to stop, and therefore your body continued with the motion of the car, right? That's how the mom arm became popular when your mom slams on their brakes, and they're like, ah, right? The mom arm is just something you develop over time. When you start driving, you'll probably learn that you do the mom arm as well, even if you're a boy. So you have the boy mom arm, or as what we call BJ because Judah calls us both mama, so we just call him boy mama. All right, um, that's the reason for seat belts. They keep us from going through the windshield when that action happens or when that force happens to our bodies as well. Second law of motion, the greater the force, the greater the acceleration. The greater the mass, the greater the force needed for the same acceleration. All right, easy example here, right? Imagine you're going to Walmart, probably to buy toilet paper, water, Clorox wipes, and Germex, hypothetically speaking. All right, if you are pushing your buggy along at like five meters a second with your bottle of Germex, 
It's pretty easy, right? Just strolling along. You don't have to apply a lot of force. You know why? Because you're strong. You don't got to apply a lot of force, right? But as your mom begins to set down case after case after case after case of water, right? It goes from like your mom no longer wants to push the shopping cart. She wants you to push the shopping cart, right? She don't want to have to push it. It's too hard to turn around the corners and so forth. You got to get a run and start. So in order to get that shopping cart to go five meters per second like it was a while ago when we were barely putting any force into it, we now have to like get a running start and slam into the shopping cart to be able to even get it to move. And then, heaven forbid, we have to stop it, right? Because that object is already in motion. It wants to stay in motion. So now we have to apply an even stronger force to get it to stop before we run over the little lady on her scooter, all right? So you guys see the example that we have there. The greater the mass, the more force we have to apply to get it to the same speed that it was once easy for us to get it to. All right, uh, the formula to be able to solve for mass in this example of number two is force equals mass times acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. What we're going to see is mass and acceleration are inversely proportional to one another. So as one increases, the other decreases. As one decreases, the other increases, and vice versa. So as mass increases, our acceleration is going to decrease to have the same amount of force. Here, if our acceleration increases, our mass decreases, and so forth. Example, the harder the player hits the ball, the faster the ball goes, all right? You know, as long as it's solid contact, but hey. If the ball had more mass, the same force would not accelerate the ball to such a high velocity. So if we have a heavier ball, and you hit it with the same amount of force, it's not going to go as far. All right, let's imagine that we have a baseball versus a bowling ball, okay? If I were to toss that baseball up and hit it, you know, just a nice solid little dinger, right? If I tried to hit the same distance with that bowling ball, which would shatter my bat, all right, when I hit it, if I hit it with the same force, it wouldn't go as far. Why? Because the mass has increased. So in order to get it to go the same distance, I'm going to have to apply a lot more force to move that bowling ball who is significantly bigger that much further or that same distance. And then law number three. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Or for every action force there is an equal and opposite reaction force. Forces are always paired. Okay, So we have an action force and a reaction force. Always. So here we have a rocket taking off. Now as that rocket takes off, we have two things happening. We have an action force. The engine is going to push down on the ground as it ignites. So the engine pushes gas down. So all the fuel and fumes and everything is pushing this way, down to the ground. At the same time, uh, the reaction force is the gas is pushing the rocket up. So one force is pushing it down, the other one is causing it to go up. Action reaction. So you can only imagine if that rocket has enough force to send it to outer space, how much force is being applied to the ground when that rocket begins to take off. So a rocket pro uh, propels burning fuel downward at high velocities. That action force has an equal and opposite reaction force of the ground pushing back on the rocket, moving the rocket upward. Action reaction pairs are sometimes difficult to identify if one object is more massive than the other. When you walk, you apply force backwards. The earth applies the reaction force, uh, pushing your foot forward. But the mass of the earth is so large that it does not move in response. So while we're pushing on the ground when we walk, and the ground is pushing back on us, we don't necessarily notice a change in the ground because the earth is so much larger than we are. We only see a change in our position as we move. Practice what you learn. I'm going to post the Sum It Up questions on Canvas for you to go through and try to figure those out. And then I will post like a, a formative or summative assessment on Google Classroom so you can go. Remember, you can use any notes. You can use anything that you have to go through these. See how well that you've learned this material um, in case we do come back for the ACAP in the next coming weeks. Shout out to Sunrise Science for this awesome PowerPoint. I hope you guys are doing good. I hope you're well. I hope no one's sick. And I hope that you are finding some way to enjoy uh, this quarantine, you know.
reading, writing, drawing, some of you like to draw, watching Netflix, whatever you're doing, I hope you're enjoying the break, and I hope to see you guys soon.